The gospel writer in Luke chapter 4, verse 38 through 41 says this, speaking of Jesus. And he rose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we stand before you in awe and wonder as not only a, the, the person, the God-man who can speak authoritatively, powerfully as we saw last week, not only who can cast out demons, but who can cast out the fever <laughs> with the word. You who created the worlds and the universe and hold all of them together by the word of your power can speak into the hurting heart and body of a, of, of a woman in some small town and rebuke a fever and make her whole. I want to sit back and, and view that kind of God who so loves the world, who so cares. And not only does he rebuke the devil, that even speaks into small places, little homes, little situations. We ask that today you would speak into our situations as well. You would speak into our lives. You would lift us up out of the hole that we have dug ourselves. You would set our feet upon a rock, the rock that is Christ. And may we leave this place thinking a little bit less about ourselves and a little bit more about Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in the age of uh, social media, I've found, and perhaps you have too, that it is very easy to spread information at the click of a button. Uh, and it doesn't matter if the information is correct or not, and it doesn't matter if we know where the sources came from. It used to be, and perhaps some of you have had this experience, you're in an English class, maybe in high school or college, and the teacher, the instructor, the professor is just, just riddling you to check your sources like everything in the paper, it seems like. That comma, where did that come from? Can you cite that, you know? Like cite everything. And yet, with a push of a button at our fingertips, we should check sources, but we don't always. Uh, and sometimes we don't even read the entire article. We just read the headline. And it's, it's what we often call clickbait. It's sensational, grabs our attention, strokes our emotion. We click the button, we spread it to 10 uh, hundreds, maybe even thousands of other people without actually knowing if it's true or what those sources are. And I bring that up because there is this other thing that I like to refer to as the clickbait of Christianity. That is that there are some sayings in the Christian world that don't actually come from the Bible. And some of them are hilarious. Some of them are pretty bad. <laughs> some of them are actually good. They're just not attributed to the Bible. I'll bring up one that's actually a good one. Um, God moves in mysterious ways. That's actually probably a true statement. You can probably deduce from the Bible in your own experience that God is mysterious. I asked him all these questions. He didn't give me the answers I wanted, and he does what he does when he wants to do it. Uh, but that line isn't directly from the Bible, even though that line is probably true. Uh, that's from a guy named William Cowper, and later uh, a band by the name of U2, the lead singer named Bono, who is writing that phrase, not about God, but about a woman. She moves in mysterious ways. Bow, chicka, 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 right? <laughs> but that one's not too bad. And there, there's other lines. Uh, this too shall pass. Ever heard that one? Ever used that one? This too shall pass. Whenever there's suffering or difficulty in our life, this too shall pass. It, it'll be done eventually. How many of you have, been go have gone through some difficulties that have never actually passed, right? What's more is that line isn't actually from the, uh, I've got to tell you this story. Uh, the former uh, coach of the Chicago Bears, Mike Ditka, right? 
uh, brought the Bears to a Super Bowl win, I believe in 1989, I believe it was, uh, but almost a decade later started having a, just a, a poor season, and he was fired. And at a press conference, he was asked how he felt, and he responded, Scripture tells you that all things shall pass. This too shall pass. Unfortunately, it's not in the Scriptures. <laughs> and sometimes things just don't pass because you want them to pass. Oh, that one isn't too bad. Let me give you a bad one. God will never give you more than you can handle. God will never give you more than you can handle. Uh, that comes, that, that's slightly related to a, a, a popular passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, but it doesn't quite say that. It speaks about temptation. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But when you experience that temptation, God is faithful. He will provide for you a way out of that temptation. When you are tempted to do something to compromise, God will provide you a way out to not compromise. This is about temptation, not about suffering. How many of you can attest, I've been through things that I could not handle. And only by the grace of God was I able to get through that. If you haven't, just read the book of Job. Or read Paul, you know, <laughs> when he speaks about wanting, you know, about uh, going through such difficulties that it was like the threat of death was upon him. And he says that it, it was for a reason. It was so that the power would be attributed to God and not himself. God actually does bring us through things that we can't handle so that we can depend upon him and his grace to get us through those things. So some, uh, some sayings are fun, funny, maybe even a little bit true, maybe really true. Others, not so true. Others are completely berserk. God does give us stuff that we can't handle. So there's a, there, there are a few. I have actually three more. Uh, all sayings that Christians sometimes quote that are not in the Bible and are in fact contradicted by this text that we're gonna read, a beautiful and gorgeous text. I thought it would be a fun way of looking at this passage today is under the headings of sayings that aren't in the Bible. You ready for the first one? God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> God helps those who help themselves. I read in an article that this is one of the most popular sayings uh, among people uh, that actually isn't in the Bible at all. God helps those who help themselves. This kind of sentiment means, you know, kind of get your leg up and, and pull yourself up by the bootstraps and then God will meet you halfway. Now, God will help you, but you gotta, you gotta help him help you. You gotta get your act together. You gotta work harder. You gotta do something. Uh, actually, not from the Bible at all, anywhere. The earliest recording of the saying is actually from Aesop's fable, Hercules and the Wagoner. A man's wagon got stuck in a muddy road and he prayed for Hercules to help. Hercules appeared and said, get up and put your shoulder to the wheel. And the moral given in that story was, the gods help them that help themselves. All right, Greek mythology couldn't be farther from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and you can see it, and I just wanna pull out a few vignettes from this text. I want you to read this first line. Verse 38 in our text, and Jesus arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Actually, two lines. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. Uh, scholars say that this is more than just a, a, a fever here. Luke actually is a doctor uh, by uh, by vocation, so he knows a few things, and he describes in the ancient world as a type of fever uh, that can be related to a few other things in that day, but that is, is actually pretty deadly. And so she is laying, she's laying out on her bed uh, without any hope in the world. She might possibly die from this. There's nothing that she can do, and God steps into her helplessness. If you can understand that picture, you can understand the gospel, which is far different from this very popular saying. God doesn't help those who can help themselves. God helps people that are on their deathbed. 
God helps people who cannot help themselves. God helps people who are terminally ill. God helps people who have, uh, who have uh, something in their body that they can't possibly deal with on their own. God helps people who are so down at the bottom of the barrel that they can't even hope, they don't, can't even imagine how to even begin pulling themselves out. Those are the types of people that God loves to help. And you can, you can move out as a launch pad from this text to see this all over the Bible. You never see anything about God helping people who are able to help themselves. What you see is the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are hungry. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus' State of the Union address as he's inaugurating his kingdom. Who are the types of people that Jesus came to see? I have not come to those who have need uh, uh, who are healthy, I have, I'm a doctor who's come to those who are sick, as he would tell the Pharisees later on. Luke chapter four, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for a unique purpose, to meet those who are poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed. So this is false. It's not true that God helps those who are able to help themselves, Rather, he helps those who are helpless. But what I love about this passage, this particular verse, is that it seems to go a step farther. Not only does God help the helpless, it seems like he starts, he, he comes after people who aren't even looking for him in the first place. Look at that first line. And Jesus arose and left the synagogue, which is where spiritual people gather, left that place and entered Simon's house. Do you know who Simon is? That's, that's the person who will later be named Peter, one of the uh, future apostles of Jesus, his right-hand man. But this is before any of that happens. Jesus has not yet told him to cast down his nets. Jesus has not yet given him a miraculous display of power, catching all of those fish. We're gonna hit all of that later. That's not happened yet. There are not yet crowds forming around Jesus uh, out of popularity. For all intents and purposes, Simon, he, he might have heard about this guy, but, but that, that spark in his heart has not seemed to, to, uh, to burn yet. He's not coming after Jesus at this point. It doesn't seem like. Jesus comes into his home before Simon starts coming after him. Not only does God help those who are helpless, sometimes he's working on them before they're even looking for him. This should give incredible comfort to those of you that have that person in your mind. And you're like, I just wish God would change that person. Maybe that person is right next to you and your elbow is just starting to creep over the armrest right now. You're like, you know, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, son, daughter, parent, coworker, friend. I just wish God would work on them. If there's anything you can grab from this passage, sometimes God is working on people and you don't even see it. Sometimes God is working on you before you even begin looking for him or even noticing your need. God is working behind the scenes. And in this scene, before Simon even knows what's, what's about to hit him in the years to come, Jesus walks into his living room. I think Jesus is walking into some of your living rooms this morning. I think he's been doing this maybe for days, maybe for weeks, waiting for you to turn around and to receive your healing. God's been working. God helps the helpless, not those who can help themselves. Second line, ready for this one? This is one of my favorites. Cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> and you know, whatever, insert whatever you want to make it more relevant for you. Beauty is next to godliness. Honor is next to godliness. Esteem is next to godliness. Popularity is next to godliness. That which the world finds attractive is next to godliness. And so we place this otherworldly value on the things that the world values, and we begin chasing after those things. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Some of you are not clean. Some of us are not clean. We're listening to that, and we're like, mm -mm. <laughs> Not from the Bible, thank God. 
It originated, this line, as an ancient Babylonian and Hebrew proverb, because, uh, uh, but it, it became very popular during the Victorian era, go figure, after being revived by Sir Francis Bacon and John Wesley, but not from the Bible. Uh, and by the way, my son, Jude, proves this line absolutely false by every stretch of the imagination. God, this isn't in the Bible, but it should be. When God created dirt, he created it, and he said that it was very good. And then he created Jude. (laughs) And he called them to be together. (laughs) And when he said that dirt was good, Jude looked up at God and said, amen. (laughs) Yesterday, On my birthday, I gave Jude four baths before we ate dinner. (laughs) He would look at this line and he would say, that is a heresy. (laughs) Cleanliness is next to godliness. That is not true. The Bible seems to say so as well in different ways. I want you to see this again from our text. Uh, Look again uh, down with me at verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, so so she she just got healed. Uh, Peter, or Simon's mother-in-law, just got healed immediately. Fever, just rebuked. Jesus doesn't even, he speaks to it, and it's gone. He commands fevers. And so, obviously, this was a word about the spread. Uh, It was the Sabbath day, so people start rushing to Jesus before the sun goes down. They have to stop working. So they're carrying people, they're bringing people that are sick, Uh, All those who had any who were sick with various diseases, verse 40 says, brought them to him and laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. He laid his hands on every single person that came by that day and healed them. This is absolutely incredible because we see something powerful here. We see touch. Now, this might not be bizarre to you, but you have to consider that before this episode, before this event, There is no other that I am aware of, there is no other situation in the Bible where somebody prays for healing by touching the person. They pray, they ask God for things, but this is the first time in the Bible where we see that person actually laying hands on. And not just in the Bible, but from my, uh, uh, as, as, as much as I can possibly wrap my ability to read around, Sources contemporary to the Bible, this is also Jewish sources, this was not a thing. This is a unique occurrence to Jesus. We might be able to say unprecedented for the first time in history, a healer actually reaches out and touches those who are sick. You have to imagine there probably were some lepers there, gross, dirty, not clean. Those who are sick, those who are ostracized, those who are isolated, Jesus touches every single person. Now God is, has healed before this, God is the healer, but this is the first time we see God in human form touching the people who need to be healed. You know what this says to me? It says he's not just about the bottom line and the end result. He's not just about, ah, I'll, just, I'll fix you right now. He reaches down and he touches people because he's not just concerned about results. He's not just concerned about efficiency. He's not just concerned about effectiveness. He cares about people that he has created in his own image, and he reaches out to touch them because there is a connection there. He loves people. He loves you, and he loves you even when you're not clean, especially when you're not clean. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Nope. Godliness is next to dirtiness. That's the gospel. Jesus left his clean, high-seated throne in heaven. Philippians chapter 2. Left the glories of his throne. Left the cleanliness of his heavenly living room to dwell in the mud, in the dirt, in our neighborhood. John chapter 1. Put on flesh dirty and dwelt among the dirty. Dwelt among the broken dwelt among the ashamed, to be among us and to touch. We have a God who touches. He's not one of those people that fixes your problems from behind a glass door. He breaks down the glass door 
He reaches out, he cups your face in his hands, and he says, be healed. God came to heal, yes, but he came to heal with a compassionate word. These examples, what we're looking at, before I get to the last one, all have something in common. They have to do with grace, right? Grace is, uh, in a short word, the undeserved, unmerited favor and goodness of God. It is God acting to peop- toward good or well towards people that do not deserve that. He reaches out to the unclean, to the sick. He reaches out to people who cannot help themselves. The world says that, right? Hey, you need to, you need to fix this problem yourself. You need to meet me halfway. You need to prove yourself, and then you will get rewarded. God says, I have come to people that can't even lift a finger to save themselves. I've come to the unclean. I've come to the shamed. All of these things have to do with grace. His unmerited, undeserved favor being showered upon the least likely. Grace is God coming to do what only he can do so that we could have what we could not deserve and did not deserve. Now the problem on our end with this is that we lo- I love the grace of God because who, who wouldn't want that? I want ge- God to give me things that I don't deserve. The, the, the disconnect or the conflict, at least with me, comes when that grace is being showed towards other people, specifically people that I don't think should deserve it. Or maybe even people that are my enemies. People who have slighted me. I hate when God shows them grace. Those are the hard points. I want God to show me grace, but when it comes to other people, I want to, and here's the third line, I want to fight fire with fire. I'll read my Bible and pray every day and grow, grow, grow and come to church and wave my hands and clap my hands and talk with you over a croissant about Jesus. But on Monday, if people cross me, I'll cross them back. Speaking rhetorically, I will not cross you back. This is what's deep down inside. If you cut me off in the parking lot, I will yell at you. If I have a way to get by or to get forward in business, I will do it at your expense. I will cut my way to the top. I will push people to the bottom. I will stomp on heads in order to climb the ladder of success to get what I want. Because when it's between me and you, ain't nobody watching my back but me. And if somebody comes after me, I've got one hand on my sword, and one hand watching my back, and my eyes on you. I'm going to fight fire with fire. This is a typical and maybe even common outlook on life from Christians. Our faith is privatized, us and God. It's great. But once we step out into the real world, real world, we live by the world's values. I'm going to fight fire with fire. I'm going to use whatever means necessary to get what I want, to get ahead and to take care of myself, even if that means that it's at your expense. Now, why do I bring that up? I bring that up again because of our text. Uh, look at this last, this last section of uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 41. The demons, as he was laying hands on all of these that were sick, there happened to be some that had demons, like we saw last week. And demons also came out of many, crying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. Have you ever wondered why Jesus would do that? Uh, this isn't the first time. He, he, he does this on a regular occasion. Demons will proclaim, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. You've come to destroy us like all true things. And he keeps telling them to shut up. It, doesn't, it almost doesn't make sense. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. One is that maybe Jesus doesn't want a demonic testimony. You know? you know, God is you know, coming to earth, and he's about to set up his earthly kingdom, maybe, uh, or uh, earthly and spiritual and heavenly kingdom. Maybe 
Maybe uh, his first PR guy shouldn't be Satan. I don't know. Maybe not a good fit for the job. The other reason is that all of those words, even though they're true, are very political. I spoke about this, I think, uh, a couple weeks ago, the politics of Jesus. Messiah, Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, baptism even. All of those things in the first century had huge political connotations. They meant one thing, revolution. A new king is coming to upset the old king, to take his throne, and to put us into power. Every person, even, even, even Simon, uh, one, of the, one of the gospels describes Simon, Peter, as a zealot. He was a zealot. He was one of those sects of uh, the Jewish people that just wanted to take over, uh, wanted to fight Rome, wanted to battle them, wanted to usurp the Roman Empire and take it over. They were zealots. Peter was a zealot. A lot of Jesus' followers were longing. They saw Jesus as the Messiah, but they saw him as a Messiah who would take control by ways of power that they were used to. Rome did this to us, we're gonna do it to them. Fight fire with fire. Now Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and he is the Son of God, and he did come to set a kingdom that would know no end, but he doesn't do it the way that Peter wants him to do it, and he doesn't do it the way that we often want him to do it. Jesus' kingdom is established on his terms, not ours. Ours, which sometimes comes by way of power and control and asserting ourselves and displays of authority and putting ourselves ahead. Jesus comes on, in on the scene, the most powerful human on the face of the planet, and he comes to serve. In fact, he would say the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he does it to the point of death. Jesus himself, he dies on the cross. In an outlandish display of selfless servanthood and love. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 tells us, and this was hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet said, there is coming a servant, a suffering servant. And he says, and I quote, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He will come to take upon him all that grieves us, all that hurts us, our suffering. He will take it upon his body. Speaking eventually about about the cross. But look at that last line. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. You know, what, you know what Isaiah is speaking about hundreds of years prior? He's saying, this, this guy is coming to do what God wants him to do, that is to suffer, even to the point of death. And we're not gonna understand it. We're gonna think that God is punishing him because that does not make sense to people who win. Winning does not look like death. It does not look like embracing suffering. It does not look like surrender. It does not look like giving up. And the guy who will win everything is gonna come and do just that. He's gonna turn the values of earthly kingdoms on their head, and they're all going to eventually come to his feet and worship him. He's gonna do it the opposite way. He's gonna do it through death. The world's way is to fight fire with fire. You're coming at me strong, and I'm going to come at you stronger. Jesus' way is to fight fire with grace. That means that he shows grace not just to me, but to the people that I have a hard time with, to the people that I disagree with, to the people that contradict me and confront me, to the people that are inconveniences to me, to the people that I'd rather not be around. God loves them just as much as he loves me. And that grace doesn't just, just, doesn't just soften my heart to receive help in time of need. It should, if I'm open to it, cause me to see other people in a different way too. To see myself not just as a, a dirty, helpless piece, per, a person that God is willing to touch out of grace, but to see other people as worthy of touch too. The commonality in so many of these examples, these sayings, 
that the gospel contradicts uh, is that they are all, in one way or another, ways of saving ourselves. God helps those who save themselves. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Fight fire with fire. Take care of yourself. Or in other words, be good, clean your act up, get them before they get you. Be good, clean your act up, get it before it disappears. Where grace comes in, the grace of God, and says, I've not come to those who have it all together or under the illusion that they have it all together. I've not come to those who are good and clean and strong and healthy in this world. I have come to those who are desperate enough to, uh, for change and, know, and have the self-awareness to know that they can't fix themselves. And lo and behold, those types of people flock to Jesus in this chapter. And it's almost counterintuitive that those are the types of people that experience complete wholeness. Look at Peter's mama. She is immediately made whole. And what's her response, by the way? Immediately she rose and began to serve Jesus and everyone in the house. What a beautiful response to someone who has been made whole by Jesus Christ not because of anything that they were able to do for themselves, but by an act of sheer grace, who understands that, who sees that, immediately turns towards Jesus, says, I'm gonna follow you, and here's a, here's a, here's a hamburger. <laughs> he just starts making food for him. We can, we can think of this as an offering of service and gratitude and worship. You might not be able to make a, a sandwich for Jesus today, but perhaps you can offer to him a sacrifice of praise, as Hebrews tells us. Perhaps what we need as a church right now is to stop being so self-sufficient. Stop trying to impress God. Stop trying to uh, get our acts together and clean our lives up so that he'll be impressed with us, so that he'll accept us, so that other people will accept us. Perhaps what we need most whether it's for the first time or for the hundredth time, is to go back to the low point, to remember how far we have fallen, how far we have come, and to recognize how deeply we need a Savior to step into our living room when we weren't even looking for him in the first place. How deeply we need a Savior to step into our mess to step into our filth, to step into our dirtiness, to step into our helplessness, and to open our eyes, to take off the shackles, to break the chains, to lift us up to where he is. Perhaps what we need right now more than anything is to remember the grace of God who reached out when we could not reach up, set his foot down in our mess, and touched us. Maybe what we need more than anything this morning is a touch of God. But that touch comes to people who recognize their desperate, broken need for it in the first place. And that itself, too, is an act of God. Maybe he's moving on your heart. Maybe he's showing you right now, gosh, I need help. And if that's you, you're in the perfect place to receive. I'm going to ask... Robert and Colette to come out here as we sing together. And as we do, let's just spend a few minutes this morning just doing just that. Asking ourselves, where in my life do I need a touch of God? Or maybe before it was, where in my life do I need to fix things? Where in my life do I need to improve? Where in my life do I need to get better? Where in my life do I need to do the right thing? Instead, let's ask, where in my life do I need a supernatural move of God? Where have I fallen so hard that I can't get up? In Christ, will you meet me there? Some of you might need healing just like this woman and these crowds. 
You're also in the right place. And I don't mean this building. I mean before Jesus, the healer. Some of you, it might be emotional healing. You might have decades of things in your life that have been holding you down and tripping you up, things that maybe go all the way back to your family of origin, patterns and behaviors in your life that you just can't break. Some of you, maybe it's spiritual healing. Maybe, maybe you feel restless inside and you, you can't explain it. You feel sick inside. Some of you, maybe it's physical healing. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was upon him in a unique way to bring healing to people who are sick of all kinds. And I have a mind to think that if some of you were to ask for healing today, right now, he would meet you. Maybe in the way that you were expecting and maybe in a completely unexpected way. I want to invite you this morning to worship, to pray to, to sit in the presence of, and to respond to a God who touches the unlovely. And that might be the best news any of us have ever heard. Heavenly Father, minister to us today as we respond to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.